Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Bar Exchange. This is episode two, cycle two of November 1st, not second, almost 2020. Happy beginning of the fall or autumn. Uh, Alejandro, um, again, another episode of the Bar Exchange. I'm Luigi Pesciabarra, a translational neuroscientist living in New York. And we are with psychologist Alejandro Ibarra, which he, he is an expert. He's a clinical psychologist. He's an expert in obsessive compulsive disorder and specialized also in telehealth and telemedicine treatment. How are you, Alejandro? How was this week? How was Halloween? <laughs> Thank you, Luigi, for having me. Thank you. We are two months left for 2020. It's uh, very exciting. It's getting cold. It's, I assume it's not cold in Sevilla in Spain, but here the temperature changes uh, drastically. And we have... Um, election week this week coming. So last episode, cycle one, episode two, we spoke heavily on personalized individualized treatment. We spoke about how cognitive behavioral therapy is far superior both statistically and anecdotally uh, from your own experience to only cognitive treatment, okay? And we, we spoke about how one therapy, the e e ERP, just because it's a set of of treatment and therapy, it, it doesn't mean it's universal. It can be adapted and adjusted and modified to every single patient and therefore does has the individualized treatment. Therefore, it is a personalized therapy. So now let's take two steps back and think about the diagnosis. okay? Let's talk about the diagnosing in OCD. There's a lot of questions online that say, why if all this information is out, if all the videos, all the articles are out. Uh, you've seen a lot of uh, questionnaires and a lot of surveys and a lot of uh, seven reasons why you have OCD that can be from a Harvard or a Mayo Clinic website to a Cosmopolitan survey, the magazine. Why you cannot diagnose someone via email, via survey, via text messages? Why you need to communicate with the patient? Yes, it's, it's very difficult, Luigi, and, uh, and it's a very import, important point because it's very difficult to, to do a, a proper diagnosis by email or text message or WhatsApp. Why? Because the thing, the most important thing is that we have to, to see and we, ha we have to see the, the symptoms, the clinical symptoms in OCD because sometimes many, many patients in order to uh, search in the information, they can't like um, not be of all to put all the information uh, in, in front of you. So the most important thing is to, to see the client because uh, some of them can like watching some other symptoms or whatever. Imagine uh, many suffer, many people that the comorbidity is with GAD or, or PTSD or depression. It's very difficult and very, it's, n it's not the best way by email to do a proper diagnosis and then after that, a proper treatment. The best way is via uh, Skype or Zoom or video. And in, in some times and in many cases by telemedicine, telemedicine and telehealth is a, a good option. It's not the best option, but it's a good option. But you mean ju just the phone call? Yes. By audio. That's what yeah. you mean by, by tele like instead of video, the phone call. Yes. That would be like priority uh, option, best second option, but the video will be exactly. better if possible. Exactly. It's like, a, like a, the, the second good option. The first one is video, and the second one is, is tele, telehealth or telemedicine or by, by phone. Because we need uh, um, some specific... information. But email is not the best way. Sometimes uh, many people contact to me by, okay, I feel very sad or I feel like... Uh, Mm, I don't know, like uh, whatever symptom. So this is OCD or this is GAD. I don't know. I don't know. We, we have to, we need to uh, watch or see the client. We need more information. We need the evolution of the disorder. We need the symptoms, the symptoms, clinical symptoms. We need 
uh, the comorbidity, we need the proper treatment or not, the diagnosis with a psychiatrist or medic, medical doctor or whatever. We need more information. And that information we put into Skype or Zoom or whatever, but through video is the best way. And I assume another component of, okay, now that we're living in pandemic times, but you mentioned how you've been doing Skype and video treatments since 2009. So that's 11 years over a decade that you've been already treating patients. So you like the pandemic really didn't change that much your model, uh, your status, your model operandi of how to conduct treatment. But one advantage that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, please, that the video is superior to an audio call is that, especially when you talk about obsessive compulsive disorder, anxiety, and especially about the strip types, you need to see the gestures and the expressions and the signs and almost like the body language that a person has when they're, exp when they're telling you about their symptoms, their stories, when they're explaining their level of stress, that you need to see what, how they're saying it, what, why they are saying the way they do, how are they expressing themselves, and not so much what they're saying. Like, that would be an advantage. And also to know if they're really honest and they're, they're being sincere and genuine in the things they're saying. Yes, remember that one of the characteristics character in personality in OCD is ethical and morality, like scrupulosity, OCD, that is religious, ethical and morality. And that, that definitely this is one of the most important characters in this kind of population in, in, in OCD community. So it's very difficult and it's very strange to uh, treat a client that don't tell you the truth and don't tell or, or tell you lies. It's, it's not very common. So we need, we need to see the, the client, we need some expression. We need um, the, like the intensity in the suffering, the anxiety, the expressions. When, when they say, for example, um, I'm suffering about POCD, about pedophile OCD, and they cannot put all the information under the table. They cannot say all the information. So the experience tells us that the best way is to help them to put all the information. Okay, your, your, your kind of POCD is maybe if you feel uh, attraction by adolescents or uh, children between eight years old or 13 or 14 years old, and that happened to you, and that is that, like help to the client to put all the information that we need. So, okay, yes, are you reading my mind? I, I, I feel that, I feel that you understand me. I feel that you are the proper uh, therapist to, to see me and to help me in my path of recovery, for example. And all of this information is maybe and is necessary by watch the, the client. However, there's a strong argument that a lot of people are making right now that when it comes to specific psychological disorders like antisocial personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, malignant narcissistic personality disorder, a combination of Machiavellic, sadistic, na narcissist, antisocial personality disorder, a, a characteristic besides the lack of empathy and remorse is also the lack of honesty and the ability of looking you in the eye and be very manipulative and lie about their symptoms in order to to get a specific um, goal. So when, when you say about the co com comorbidities of obsessive compulsive disorder, are any of these other psychological disorders tend to overlap and tend to be comorbid with OCD? It's, it's not very common. It's not very common. The most common uh, OCD uh, disorder and comorbid comorbidity is with uh, PT, PTO, P, POCD, that is personality, obsessive compulsive disorder, is not OCD, POCD, and uh, passive aggressive in, in some case, for example, but sadic and this kind of uh, pers personality disorder is not, it's not very common. It's not that uh, it doesn't exist, but it's not very common. The, the, the 30% in OCD is with POCD. Right. It, it will make sense, especially what you said about that they really care about ethics and morals and values. 
you made an example about a person like it's a lot of stress all of a sudden we feel attracted to adolescents and teenagers and they have a wife with kids and all of a sudden this happening is is that moral and ethics and respect for the law and respect for the dignity of another human being especially a children that is causing causing them that is causing them the stress a person with a social personality wouldn't 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 feel the stress of that they would just get out of their way that's right it wouldn't it wouldn't make it it wouldn't make more sense. But w when it comes to diagnosing a person with via audio, just the phone or via video, does it have this? Has it occurred the times that the person, because of the stigma and the, maybe the shame and the embarrassment of you know communicating these, they don't even though it's you know via telehealth telemedicine, they, they don't want you to see their their face. They would rather just the the phone, you know, as a way to dodge you know, and maybe they're more comfortable speaking. Or what about there's a technical issue? You know, the, sometimes video, you can have the best Wi-Fi and internet in the world and be in the same city. Sometimes with the video, you lose audio, sometimes the device. Has it ever occurred, like, has it, has it happened that sometimes the audio was a better option for diagnosing the audio phone call yes, than the video? Yeah, it depends on, depends on, you know, our practice office, we, we are, uh, working with um, Skype, Zoom. First of all, Skype, since 2009, uh, we are 11 years ago working with. But in this time, uh, we continue to um, improve in this tool and these strategies. So in many cases, we don't, we don't need to, to look to the face, to the sufferer. We, we, we need to listen. Just listen the the voice. Just listen the the symptoms. Just listen the sentence. Just listen the thoughts. That is very important because the the experience help you how to manage all the symptoms or all the diagnosis and all the treatment in less time. Okay. So to 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 me and and to my to my team is is easy. It's easy because we work with this kind of disorder every day. So to a psychologist or psychiatrist or medical doctor that does, doesn't have the uh, total experience is, is most difficult. It's, it's very difficult. But in our case, in our practice office, it's, it's easier because we, we, we have the experience and we work with every single day. So it's, it's easier. So we don't need four sessions or uh, at least eight session to do a right or proper diagnosis and after that a correct treatment. No, just in a maybe 15 or 20 minutes, five, 10 or 15, 20 minutes, we, we got all the information, all the symptoms, all the uh, intensity of the convulsions or rituals, mental rituals, or uh, for example, motor rituals, like washing your hands or checking the the off or the windows or whatever. So we don't we don't need we don't need too many sessions. We need one session to psychoeducation, psychoeducation, psychoeducation OCD, psychoeducation ERP, and very important, very important because ERP is the gold standard treatment. And how how you are going to um, recover? How you are going to um, like walking the path? to their recovery that is very important that is in just one session that is extremely important to know you do really well in usa uh, here they sometimes depending on your insurance they only allow one session to come up with a diagnosis so it's really really important that you're saying i don't need eight se eight sessions because of your experience in your years of speaking with a lot of patients of all types subtypes you only you don't even need one whole session you need just 20 minutes to get the diagnosis and then being able to provide the psychoeducation and strategic plan. That means after one session, the patient that comes to you and your practice can already decrease the levels of frustration. They're already, they're already gaining something. They're already, they already have a plan. They already have a response. They already have a diagnosis. And that doesn't, an, an actual accurate, objective clinical diagnosis that it's not um, a questionnaire on a Cosmopolitan magazine. However, speaking about the whole, in America, and I told you many times, we see the patient as a micromanager to the doctor. The patient tells the doctor what to do, 
probably not in surgeries, but definitely, you know, when it comes to the clinician, they um, sometimes they come very more, more informed um, than what they think. What happens in terms of treatment? You're saying that, okay, a phone call can, it's definitely not the best option, but it's way better and it's do, doable than text messages, emails, or messages through WhatsApp. If we can do the video, obviously. If we can be in person, obviously, when we go back to uh, normalcy. But a phone call would be just fine. Has it ever happened that you're treating someone, okay, with your specific treatment, with cognitive behavioral treatment, with ERP? Has it ever happened that sometimes you have a malfunction via video and you have to continue the consultation and the treatment uh, with the phone? Like, has that happened? Does it work? Is it frustrating? Did you see any difference? Tell me a little bit about that. Yes, absolutely. Last week, like last week in, in, in oh. one session, the, the past Tuesday with one of my clients that live here in, in Seville, because we, don't, we, don't, we are not working with uh, face-to-face with, with clients. We are all working with via Skype or Zoom at this moment by the, the, the COVID. No? So last week, uh, last Tuesday with one of my clients, it, it, it's not a, like a good connection with Skype, a, a very bad connection. So I tell to her, okay, no problem, don't worry. The, today is not the day to Skype. We are going to work with a phone call. So I call her by a phone call and do the information, do the continue to working with ERP by phone call. And it's very easy. It's not very, it's not as important the, like, uh, like doing this through Skype or through phone call. You need the, the, the experience. And in, with this client, I, I was working with her about six months, six or seven months. But it doesn't matter six or seven months. Uh, maybe with a client that has maybe one month with us, it's maybe uh, we can do it by, by phone call. Today, today we, we have to work with with the information, with the internet, with all the, the tools to put all to the service, to the OCD software. So I don't understand at this moment, and I don't know how are many psychologists in the world, in Latin America, for example, and here in Spain that don't, doesn't believe in Skype, doesn't believe in this kind of tool, doesn't believe in anything. So it's a problem because we have the evidence through the studies, through, through all the research, through, through all the information. And the studies are that the results show us that uh, Skype is a, a, a maybe as possible, as good as face-to-face. So it, it, it's not a, it, it's a reality. That is the truth. And, and uh, all this information is created to improve the quality of life in all the OCD suffering and OCD population. Yeah, I find it amazing that you can have a doctor that still wants the patient to come to, into the private practice, the office in the middle of the pandemic and conduct uh, a therapy, a cognitive behavioral therapy with a mask as opposed to via treat. I also find it amazing that like for the last 11 years, you've that being diagnosed in treating and successfully improving people's lives that have OCD and additional psychological disorders, comorbid or stresses related to, and you maybe you've never ever met them. It has just been through the window, through 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 video, through Skype, through WhatsApp, through. I, I find that very very rewarding. And a couple of uh, two more questions I wanted to ask you was when you talk about the subtypes of OCD and you, you're saying you only need 20 minutes for a specific diagnosis. That, that is true across all subtypes. Like it's, there aren't, for example, um, OCD relationship. It's harder to diagnose than OCD homosexuality than another OCD contamination. Has it ever happened that maybe the personality OCD, as you mentioned, a strong comorbid personality disorder that makes the person very rigid and, and controllable and uh, detail oriented that you know sometimes shadows and these guys is they're having an actual anxiety of OCD. Um, 
is so is is that true? Is that is that universal? The diagnosis it doesn't change it between uh, subtypes. The time it takes for you to diagnose depends on what the the truth is that uh, doesn't matter what is the the content on the on on the subtypes of the OCD. OCD is OCD, and with just two or three sub thoughts, we we can like describe all the OCD. Mm, cycle in obsessions, anxiety, disorder, shame, guilty of the process. And it's not uh, one subtype is most, more, more difficult than another. No, no, it's not the reality we, to a professional, to a, a professional with expertise. Uh, whatever, for example, Stephen Phillipson that lives and working in New York, it's very easy for him to create or describe a subtype. How, how, how long time it takes? Five minutes, three minutes, six minutes, it's very easy. The content is doesn't matter. The, the truth is not depends on POCD or HOCD or ROCD. Depends on the equation between obsession, anxiety, and compulsion. OCD is OCD, and it, it's not very difficult to put all the um, diagnosis and the proper treatment. The, the most important thing is the proper treatment. That is the key. That is the key because in the last episode we were talking about and um, how to individualize all the treatment. And that, that is very important because the, the, the key of the successful in treatment is that part of ERP to create all the tools in, in, in base uh, or individualize the, um, each session and each exposure response prevention and how to create all the tools and after a long time or long time working with ERP after that the ACT and uh, mindfulness techniques all the process and all the uh, the like the tools but the first of all ERP and the most important important thing, thing in this equation but also has to do with your expertise, your level of training and professionalism, because, um, and, and we spoke about this before in February, right before the pandemic started, there was this, uh, a, a very famous article in uh, BBC. Uh, it was probably a TV segment too, about how a doctor uh, wrongly diagnosed their patient with pedophilia, as opposed to OCD pedophilia. Even though they've seen each other in person, they listen to their symptoms, but there was a wrong diagnosis that actually caused a lot of suffering and stress long term. That was right before the, the pandemic. It was one of the things that made me interested in this topic the most about how if you don't understand uh, the disorder, how can you misdiagnose someone? How obviously the doctor, I believe it was a psychiatrist, he wasn't specialized in OCD as you. So he just heard the person and thought, that's it, pedophilia. And what a, you can only imagine uh, the level of stress in that person. Uh, and it was good that he shared his story months later and said, my doctor misdiagnosed me. I actually had OCD pedophilia, completely different, a whole, uh, very different. So it really, really depends on the, on the treatment. And that enters, it's a good seg segue to my last question that I have with you. How often do you collaborate with psychiatrists, with neurologists? Do they refer patients? Do you refer them back? Do they come to you with an MRI, with an EEG, with a blood sample test and say, this is what I, I just saw my medical doctor. This is what they told me. How, how often does that happen, if at all? Yes, it's not very common. We are here in, in Seville, two psychiatrists that are uh, work in collaboration with us. And in some case that the um, sufferer, the client need to put the medication, we refer to, to him or to them to put the, the medication. But the, tr the truth is uh, they refer to me more clients. Last week, uh, I don't know who, a uh, psychiatric, uh, a girl, that referred to me a patient and I, I don't know who's her. But the, the truth is, is that more psychiatrists come or refer to, to me more clients and it, it's a good collaboration, but depends on the different culture between Spain, United States and Latin America. And you and me know because we family are and, and, and we're 
medical doctor and in Latin America, they put uh, medication to like every day and you, you are super OCD, okay, take some pills, take some medication. But here now, we, we work with the psychologist model versus psychiatry or medical doctor model. And that, that is a very important point because in Latin America, the sufferer is going to psychiatrists first than the psychologist. Here in Spain, no. Here in Spain, we search the information by internet or by another psychologist or psychiatrist and come to our practice office with no medi medication. And if uh, the client has intensity and several symptoms, we refer to the psychiatry. In Latin America, it's like, uh, the, the process is different. You are suffer with depression, okay, psychiatry, I take some pills. You are GAD or PTSD or OCD, okay, take some pills. There is no- Like vitamins, yeah. Exactly, that, to, to, in my opinion, it's not the, the, the best choice and it's not the best way to, to treat the, the client. So, so sorry, just based on that example you just cited, would you say that in terms of psychoeducation, Spain has a higher level of psychoeducation than most of the countries in Latin America where the psychiatrist is first, psychology second? I, I think that, I think yes, I think yes. And in the last conference in Spanish, we, we, see, we see through the, the conference to the psychiatrists, to many psychiatrists putting and, and recommend pills, antidepressant, ESRS, or and, and, anxiolytics, or some medicines to OCD before the treatment with ERP. To me, in my opinion, that is a, a, a mistake. We prefer to do ERP, and if the client needs some medicine or some pills, okay, refer to a psychiatrist. Because in, in, not in, in, in all the case, not in many case, they need medication. In many cases, they need just ERP. And we are many clients in our practice office that has recovery with no medication. A high percent of clients, they are recovering with no medication. So we prefer to work with ERP, just ERP. And if, we, we, the, if the person is getting improving or getting, getting better to the symptoms, just with ERP is perfect. It's perfect. And I find it absolutely even more fascinating the fact that antidepressants come first or to treat OCD, because we know that even though antidepressants for this, for OCD are tend to be proven to be more effective than anti-anxiety medication, than anxiolytics, they don't work right away. Just like in depression, they work two to three weeks after they start taking it. And they don't work until you hit a certain amount. Like for ex with Soloft or with a specific uh, antidepressant that you use to treat OCD, the patient must hit almost three times the level of milligrams and the doses that they will take if they have a major depressive disorder. Exactly. So they won't see any improvement, any benefits until two to three weeks or a month after they see the psychiatrist. With a psychologist, with your treatment with ERP, they can see the effects right away. One therapy, uh, one treatment of meditation, one therapy, at least they have a strategic plan of knowing what to, what to do. It's a, they actually will get a short-term gain that it's a patient with these levels of stress and anxiety, it's probably what you're looking for at the beginning. Exactly, and in not in, not in many cases, the, the patient with, for example, Soloft or paroxetine or fluoxetine, they get better because they need to, to take at least three times up to the dosage to a depression. So in not in many cases, and not in all cases, they, uh, they get better, they improve the symptoms. Because medication in OCD is at around 15 or 20 percent of the treatment and ERP is at least 75 and 80 percent of the gold standard treatment and, and that, that is very important point. A big, a big takeaway from this uh, besides videos don't substitute diagnosis and diagnosis must be uh, definitely at least done via video or at least a phone call never via email is that 
the most of the countries in Latin America and the medical systems, at least when it comes to OCD, the psychoeducation needs to be higher and they need to match more the system in Spain as opposed to the opposite. So uh, it's, it's very now clear one of the many reasons why Spain makes so much money in medical tourism and why they have so many experts that actually teach globally and why so many people go to Spain and actually get a, their treatment or their, get their medical conference. They're very, very advanced on that on many areas in medicine. So thank you very much, psychologist Alejandro Ibarra for episode two, cycle two of the Ibarra Exchange. Uh, hope to talk to you very soon and hope you have a blessed week. Thank you, Luigi, for having me. See you at the next episode. And thank you. Thank you for all the information to share with all the OCD community. Thank you for your time. Take care. Absolutely. Bye-bye. Happy November. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.